am delighted that you're here today. I see some guests among us. Let's let all of our guests know how thankful they are they're with us. Thank you. Amen. Some of you are wondering if you're guests or not. Uh, if you've been here and you, you've, you realize that you're enjoying what you're, you're being a part of, we'd love for you to join us on the very first Sunday of August, and actually will be ha happening during this service up over in our coffee house area. We'll be having uh, our grow class, and it shows you how to become a part of our church, what we believe, what it means to be a part of our church, and that's going to happen uh, uh, during August in that 11 o'clock service hour, and we'd love for you to sign up. You can actually sign up at the brand new, I forgot to tell the other groups this, please don't pull out your phones and go through it now, but the brand new warhill.com, you can sign up right there uh, for grow, and it's going to be uh, a great time. Well, I believe God's going to move in our kids' lives at camp this week, amen? Yeah. Excited about it. I believe it's going to be a powerful time. Uh, I'm going to be able to go minister to, uh, I'll be in another country for just a few days, and I'm going to be able to minister to pastors in that area. And I just want to encourage you, pray for both of those things this week, and you know, God's going to speak to our hearts. I am excited. We've got Abba House in the house this morning. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. I always love when they're part and all that God's done uh, in their ministry and how much our church has reaped. I want to say that our church has reaped from Abba House being a part of uh, who we are in the week Wednesday night services when they come. And then so many of the leaders have have, uh, have become leaders here in our own church. And we are, we celebrate all of them. Let's celebrate those folks right there, can we? Amen. Amen. Well... If you weren't here last uh, month when I shared with you about the, uh, you know, the parking issues that we have here at War Hill and the, the growth issues and why this is going to be my third time to preach this message this morning, um, then you didn't know what God made available for us. We were trying to decide where we were going to have to move to and whose house we were going to be further from, and God just made a way for us to be able to purchase all the adjacent property, almost all the way down to the next road, and we are about uh, three or four weeks from concluding step one of that, and that's that acquisition of property and to uh, get the plans going so we can start the permitting process in order to begin step two, and that's going to be the, the, the building of an all-new sanctuary that I won't have to preach three times. I can preach one time. Uh, we might end up having to have two, but uh, be able to preach one time, and that's going to turn this. Now, how exciting is this? It's going to turn this sanctuary over to our youth. It's going to be, is this not an awesome youth room? Amen. I'm real excited about that. I told Pastor Michael that, and he's like, yeah, but can I change this? I said, be grateful. Come on now. Amen. But uh, uh, then we're going to build. Our, young, our children's church has been in a mobile unit for 20 years. I think it's time to get them in a solid place. And so we're going to have a new, amen, a new excited place for our children. It's all going to be great. And quadruple the parking. That's that. Just celebrate that. And, and in order to do that, you know, we're praying uh, that God's going to help us do this in these three steps, step one, step two, and step three. And we believe that it's going to be possible. We've been saving, preparing. We didn't go into this blindly. And so this is, step one is rolling. It, it, we are so excited to be able to, to say, hey, we're moving forward. There's a closing date that should be announced uh, this week. And we're excited about that purchase. But I was in the bank dealing with all that the other day. And, um, you know, I was like, Lord, I need you to make this possible. I need you to show us. And, and, and I just brought it with me this morning, and, and I'll hand it over uh, to our, I brought it in, gave it to our treasurer, and I said, but leave it in the envelope. Somebody walked up and brought me this envelope in the bank, grabs me and sticks an envelope in my face in the bank, and, and they were like trying to do it as fast as they could. And in this envelope, there's several hundred dollars in this envelope. And they said, Pastor, God spoke to my heart that this needs to go toward what you're doing. They don't go to this church. They're not a part of this church. But God was speaking to their heart. And that spoke to my heart. I said, God, if you're speaking to people who don't even go here, how much more can you speak to people who are a part of what God's doing? And we're needing in step one about $500,000 to move forward. And that's totally within our realm of who we are and to be able to do that because our God's faithful. Can I get an amen? amen. And we're going to take the step one. We're going to move forward. And we need you to consider prayerfully being a part of that. And that your envelope might not look like this, but it'll look like this. And if you'll take one of these, I want you to lay hands on that and say, God, what part is my family supposed to play in this? Christine and I are doing that. What part are we playing in providing the space? You know, one Easter. How many of you have been here, like, since the beginning? Can I, can I see your hand? There's a few, very few in this. Third. That's the 815 service predominantly. <laughs> Amen. But uh, um, 
And if I'd said it in that service, most of them would have raised their hand this morning. But our first sanctuary was right over in this small building. I'll never forget one Easter, 155 people in the coffee house area, and they took turns leaning in to see, who, to see the sermon and be a part of the message for just a moment from the foyer. Then we moved in the gym, and now we're in three services in here. And somebody said, Pastor Don, when are you going to be happy? Well, we've helped start seven other churches. God's blessed us. We're continuing to go out, and I'm going to tell you when I'll be happy, when it's impossible to go to hell from North Georgia because everybody's already saved. <laughs> Amen. That's when I'll be happy. Amen. Amen. So why don't we pray over this, and uh, where's the part of our usher team? Where, uh, Dawson, come here if you would. And uh, I'm going to turn this over since it's, uh, this is how I believe money should be handled. Amen. We're going to turn it over, and he's going to go put it where it belongs. And uh, uh, let's pray over our message and over this opportunity. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and the joy of the Lord that is our strength. I thank you for what you've already said to us today, Father. And I thank you for how you're going to bless our young people at camp this week. You're going to bless the pastors that I'll be with this week. And, Lord, you're going to bless this congregation. Over the next few weeks, I pray you'll begin to speak to the hearts of people here about how that you want them to be generous in this step one. Father, we will move forward under the banner of Christ. And Lord, we pray that you will provide a place here in this area for others to come and others to hear the exciting things that you're doing. Thank you for your power. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Now speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, the good thing about preaching a message is you can try to get it straight by the time you do it the third time. And I want to bring you uh, a message today entitled Aluminum. Aluminum. Nobody shouted. No one was excited that I'm preaching about aluminum today. I'm excited about aluminum because I know where we're going. Genesis chapter 15, for those of you who love the Old Testament, verse number 1. I love the way the New Living Translation of this reads. So sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram, just so you understand, Abram is Abraham before the Lord changed his name to Abraham in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. Now, let me just ask you, how many of you would be excited if all of a sudden the Lord spoke to you and said, hey, I've got your back and you're going to get rich. Can I, can I, how many would be excited? Come on now, amen. Amen. Woo, that'd be awesome. You, I got you back, and you're about to be rich. And some of you are already spending the money. I can see it on your face. Come on now. Amen. But listen to how Abram replies. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings? What kind of answer is that? He said, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? He said, here's my problem. Here's what I can't fix, and I just can't see anything else. I don't know, I, I didn't mean to stop here, but how many of you have ever had a problem that you can't see anything else for the problem? The struggles, the pain, the weaknesses. Well, this is what happens. He says, since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Verse number five. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, I want you to notice that the Lord took him outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Would you look at your neighbor and say faith is a process? Have you ever wondered why preachers ask you to do that? Look at your neighbor and say that? I was in church one time, and the guy said, slap your neighbor, slap your neighbor. I was sitting next to Todd. I said, if I touch you again, you're going to hurt me. <laughs> but the reason they want you to declare it is it's a learning process. It's part of not only hearing, but speaking it into your life. Because faith is a process. Now, life is all about uh, faith. It's about uh, uh, many days test our faith. Many days wonderful things happen that grow our faith. But every day we face something that will either build up our faith or tear down our faith. Now most of us can have faith, but, but 
when the fair weather times are there, it's okay. But let the storms come and our faith begins to waver and we begin to question. If everything is lined up perfectly, then we can even take a step of faith. But we have to see that it's all lined up. And what we're really saying with that is I have to make sure that I don't require faith to take a step of faith. You see, this is not a mindset that is a result of weakness or even a failure on our part, but it, rather it's a part of the view that we have of the universe. Science has taught us that the environment and outside forces have such a great impact on the results of a matter that we want to make sure we examine the entire forces to see what the results are going to be. But here's what you need to understand. Our faith is limited to most often not what we can't see, but what we do see is possible. And thus, it's not strong faith. Now, recent experience, uh, experiments have taught that what once seemed impossible is totally possible. I was really thrilled when I read this experiment. It's, it's to do with quantum physics, and, and it really kind of just, just got in my heart as I was reading this, and, and, and I thought about how we could share this this morning. You see, what was once considered impossible was that anything could go faster than the speed of light. They have recently discovered in the Bell Theorem, they have, they have, have, have discovered and re released the data that tells us this, that if two subatomic particles are shot into the universe in a subatomic uh, reaction, that as those two particles cover out into the universe, that if something happens to the one particle, it automatically happens to the other particle. Science is having a really hard time trying to explain what some have deemed the God uh, particle, the God, God part of the gene, the God part of, of, of everything that exists because they don't understand what this one thing is that seems to connect everything into being. And so in this Bell Theory, it, cl it clearly begins a study that says no matter how far, not into the room, but how far into the universe, it's actually called the, uh, the theory of non-locality. And in the theory of non-locality, no matter how far things have fallen apart, there's something between them that if something happens to this particle, it automatically happens instantaneously to the other particle on the other side of the universe. So, boom, boom. I mean, it happens instantaneous. There is no time difference between it occurring because there's some kind of connectivity. And this is important to us for a few reasons today. But there's some kind of connectivity that has the world united so that what happens here is going to begin to happen and take an effect over here. And as this begins to happen, what we realize is what was long considered impossible, that something could happen at a faster rate than the speed of light, has totally become possible now because it doesn't happen at the rate of the speed of light. It happens instantaneously, that there's some kind of a connection. We need to hold on to this for a moment, but the truth that I want you to get is this. What once was considered impossible has now become totally possible. Let me say that again and you help me with the final part of that. What once was impossible is now possible and what we see here is that God is trying to teach us that what we thought was impossible through the right process can be totally possible in our lives let me show you how simple that is when you were a baby and we have some infants with us this morning when you were a baby a, a small infant firstborn it was impossible for you to walk it was not physically possible in a baby's first a few months of, of life. It's not physically possible because through the process of developing motor skills, they have not developed the right process yet. And as well, they have not developed the right strength in their muscles to carry their frame in a walking posture. That's why we grow into crawling. That's why we go through the process of growth. Now, I said faith is a process. And you see, when you begin to walk, for that child to begin to walk uh, initially is impossible. But give that child about a year of growth. Let them go through the process of growth. And as they go through the process of growth, after about a year, you won't be praying they do walk. You'll be praying they go to sleep and stop walking. Can I get an amen? You see, you're going through a process. Someone once said that there are problems that, that only can be worked out in time. There are problems that are impossible if you think of them in a two-year term, which most people do, but if you'll learn to see them in a 50-year term, there's a lot of possibility there. To a five-year-old who hasn't learned addition and subtraction, if you give them even the, even the simplest algebraic problem, it is next to impossible. As I said algebra, some of you just cringed all over the building. But if you give that five-year-old just a few classes, just a few math classes, before long that, that problem that seemed impossible has now become totally possible because they've gone through the process that is required. 
Sometimes knowledge is the only difference between what is impossible and what is possible. I recently read an article that, that, or, or, or heard of a story and then went and studied this story that really stood out to me. That's where the message comes from today. In the 1860s, there was a famous treaty that really changed the world as we know it. And this treaty uh, was between two great world leaders, and, and the first of the leaders was Napoleon III. And so in the 1860s, upon the, the signing and the ratification of this treaty, the, the opposing governments gathered, and, and as they came together, Napoleon III had the honor of hosting the other side of the treaty, the King of Siam. And as the king of Siam gathered and came in, uh, Napoleon III wanted to show him the opulence of France. He wanted to show him all that he had accomplished. And so Napoleon III held a dinner at Versailles. And if you've ever seen pictures of Versailles, it's an amazing, beautiful, beautiful place. And it's a, a, a excess, uh, a, probably one of the highest sense of excess on the planet. As they gathered in Versailles, here was what we saw. As they gathered... They wanted to show the great honor of the moment, and so they set up each table seating very specifically. And those who were lucky graduated as they went enough to be at the table, but those that were the more senior statesmen were given uh, utensils and, and plates of silver. And those silver, uh, silverware and the silver uh, utensils and all those things that were laid out there, they knew that that was the place of honor. But at the head of the table, there was then set for Napoleon III, golden utensils, golden plates. Everything that Napoleon would use would be gold. And now for the honored guest, now for the king of Siam. As they went to set his place, they set at his place aluminum. Here this king, it's funny, some of you have the same look on your face that I had on mine in this story. Here this king that they wanted to honor greatly, was fed on aluminum. Now, how many of you would feel honored if you came to a dinner at somebody's house and everybody was eating off of gold or silver and they gave you aluminum? However, the king of Siam was not dishonored, but greatly honored. Why? Why? He was honored because in 1861, aluminum was the most precious metal on the planet. Gold was all over the walls of Versailles. But there was one set of aluminum in the room, and it was his. Now you're going, Pastor, that's what we throw away. <laughs> it is so unvaluable today that we actually have to make up our minds if it's worth getting up and walking all the way to the recycling bin with it or not. But because it was so valuable of its day, and here's the reason why. Aluminum had only been discovered about 30 years before. And the aluminum they had discovered, the process had been lost somehow, and they didn't know how to extract any more aluminum until just about the time of this meeting, and they had figured out through a very extensive and difficult process how to extract aluminum now, some of you are wondering where this is spiritually let me get you there you see in 1888 a man with the last name of Bayer created a process that was so simple to extract aluminum what was once priceless became common what was once something that you would have valued now most of us do that with he created a process that took what seemed impossible. I feel what I'm about to say. Took what seemed improbable. What took what was not within their realm. This man created a process that caused what was impossible to become common. In one simple process, the value fell. People that had invested in aluminum wept. Because in one simple process, it became the most disposable metal on the planet. And I began to get excited about this because I began to understand that faith is the process by which what we can only dream of now becomes a regular part of our lives. 
Faith is the process that when I begin to, ex- to walk in faith and express myself in faith, God begins to take me to the places that I never dreamed possible. I thought there was no hope for me in areas of my life, but because of faith, I began to trust God, and what I used to not be able to do, God brought me to and made me strong enough to do that. And there are areas of my life that I thought I would never find freedom in. And the world told me that I would always be labeled that way. But because of Jesus Christ and because of faith in Christ, what once seemed impossible now has become a part of my past. And total freedom is possible because of who I am in Christ. Amen. Aren't you glad for Christ? Amen. You see, in the spiritual realm, faith is the only difference between what is impossible and what is possible. It is a developmental process. Impossibilities disappear as we develop our faith. And how are we going to develop our faith? It's very simple. From Romans chapter 10, verse number 17, a powerful, powerful verse that says this, Then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's say that together. Then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, the process that we need is already presented in front of us. We're looking for an answer that is not the answer we want. We're looking for somebody to give us a great big easy button, for lack of a better choice, so that we can push it and everything gets right where we want it to in our lives. But God didn't call us to that. God called us to the process. He called us to come through the fire. And to go through the fire means sometimes you're going to have to go into the fire. Can I get an amen? We're going to have to go through the process, but the process is worth it because when I go through the process and I might enter out, in, I might enter the process in pain and agony, but when I come through the process, I shall come forth as pure gold because God is working on us and all he's looking for are some people who have enough faith. Amen? Amen. So if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we need to understand that we miss the, the significance of the power of God's word. Most of us think it's to give us knowledge, but knowledge is a byproduct. It isn't the ultimate goal. The purpose of Scripture is to give us faith. You see, if I read of what God did then, why can't he do it now? If my God is the beginning and the end, the first and the last who never changes, the God who parted the Red Sea then can still part the Red Sea today. The God who did the miracles of that day can still do the miracles today. The God who looked at people that could not, my goodness, I feel what I'm about to say to you, that could not come into the presence of God because they were covered with the filth of leprosy, which represents the sin of this world. And they were covered with that. And he looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they were made whole. Jesus, that same God, is still speaking to people who are covered in sin and shame and problems today and he says show yourself by faith and you will be made whole in the name of Jesus Christ amen amen when you preach about faith though because of excesses in faith that some people have taught things improper people get in divided into two camps you have the knowledge camp and the faith camp and they want to argue about it but listen to me carefully we need knowledge but the end goal ought to be faith After faith takes us further than knowledge. Because sometimes you know what you're supposed to do, but it takes faith to do it. It allows us to believe the impossible. Sometimes you just need a different viewpoint. Sometimes you just need a different process. Do you know for hundreds of years it was taught the earth was flat? For hundreds of years, you were considered certifiably insane. 1,000 years ago, it was certifiably insane to believe the world was round. Now, a thousand years later, it's considered certifiably insane to believe the earth is flat. Why? Because the process changed. Now we have images from space. We know exactly what the earth looks like through a different process. Here in Genesis 15, where we began today, I'll try to bring this quickly today, Abraham's having a crisis of faith. Now, we we can say why, because we know the end of his story. But it took him uh, 14 years to find the end of his story here. You see, the Lord had said to Abraham, I want to bless you. And he said, why? Why would you bless me? All he could do was describe the problem he couldn't fix. And that was the fact that he had no child. And then God does something very interesting to Abram. He says, let's go on a field trip, buddy. The Lord brought Abram outside beneath the sky. Told him, reading the scripture here, told him to look up into the heavens and count the stars if you can. 
Your descendants will be like that, too many to count. Verse number 6, Abram believed the Lord. He had faith. Now here's the thing. History came because of faith. Here's what God said, and we could see if we put ourselves in the story. Abram is inside. Abram is inside his problem. He's inside the struggle. He's inside his tent, and God takes him outside. When Abram was in his tent, all he could see was a man-made ceiling. God takes him outside and tells him to look up into the expanse of space that stretches billions of light years in every direction. And he said, the problem you have, Abram, is you can only see your problem. When Abram was inside the tent, he was focused on his own ability or inability, and he was focused on his own circumstances. So God gives him a different vantage point by taking him outside. The farthest he could see was eight foot under the ceiling. Abram's faith had been reduced to the size of his environment. Are you getting that? His faith had been reduced to the size of what contained him. Abram did what so many of us do. We put a ceiling on what God can do. We put an eight-foot ceiling on his love. We put an eight-foot ceiling on his power. And we put an eight-foot ceiling on his wisdom. But God in his spirit is still calling us to come outside of our problem, to come outside of our struggles, to come outside of where we are and stop looking at the limitations that man has put upon us and lift up our eyes unto our God from whence our help comes and get a perspective that is higher than we are because in him all things are possible. What did Jesus say? With Christ all things are possible. Amen. You see, God helps Abram refocus on his supernatural ability by getting him outside and giving him a different view. God gets Abram's eyes off his circumstances and focuses them on the promise of God. Faith is the process by which God moves us from inside our problem to outside with a vision of limited, I mean limitless possibility. And let me conclude today with this. Abram is inside, and God calls him outside, and he says, look up and see the stars. Now, I'm going to assume that it was a clear night and that the stars could be seen all around. How many of you have been to the, maybe you've been to the beach in one of those nights and you can just look up and you know what I'm talking about, you see the stars. Can you count for a moment yourself lucky to see this vision? Now, here's the thing. At any given moment when you're looking up to the human eye, if you see 200, 300, 400, 500 stars, and maybe 1,000 on an unbelievably clear night, you see more than most people can see. As you look up into the heavens, the human eye can only see, on average, a few hundred stars at a time. But in that view that you can only see a few hundred stars, there are literally billions of stars that you can't see. And here's what God says to him. He says, look up. This excites me. He said, look up and start counting. Inside his tent, all Abram could see was the fact he didn't have one child. Outside his tent, he starts counting. And could you imagine 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700 Abram, somewhere in there, he, he got it. He started believing. The Bible says it was that simple, not that it, the children were born, but that he believed God. And at that moment, it was counted as righteousness to him. But here's what God showed me on this. Here's what I, I found. He could only see hundreds of stars, and that got him excited. But God was not limited by Abram's vision. All Abram needed to see was a few hundred, and he was like, I'm in. But God said, see all of those stars? I'll make your descendants as many as those. Now, he could see hundreds, but how many were there? Millions. What does Hebrews teach us? That all who believe in Christ have become the spiritual seed of Abraham. God wasn't limited by what Abram could see. 
he was only limited by what he could see. And he could see it all. He said, here's my promise, son, even what you can't see. And here's the beauty of this moment. I don't care what demon in hell you fought. I don't care what battle and what problem and what struggle you've been going through. My God is greater. My God is able. My God is bigger. And what he wants you to do is to take a step out of defeat. Take a step out for just a moment of, 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 of what you cannot. I mean, Abram had tried his whole life to make this possible. And nothing seemed to work. There was crash hope everywhere. And God said, step out here and let me show you what I can do. That's what I want to ask you today. Would you trust God's word enough? You don't have to trust me. Would you trust God's word enough to step outside in faith? To step outside and believe? To step beyond what limits your faith and trust God? I don't care what record chases you. I don't care what struggle you're in. I'm preaching a God who's limitless, who's faithful who makes the impossible possible. Would you stand with me? If you would, just go ahead and bow your heads in this place. I'm going to speak directly to someone, and you'll know who you are, and this is just what I feel in my heart today. It's not in my notes. It's what I feel in my heart right now. There's somebody here that you want to step outside and you want to believe again. But what's inside that tent of pain and problems is screaming at you so loud. You're afraid what will happen if you don't have what you're used to, the pain. But God didn't call you to live in the pain. He called you to live in peace. He called you to live in hope. He called you to live in victory. This gospel I preach to you is the only way to begin that faith walk. That Jesus Christ came, he died, and he rose again. I declare to you there is no, underway, no other way under heaven by which you will find the peace that you're after than to meet the Prince of Peace, the King of Heaven, to know Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you're facing some kind of an impossibility, that you're willing to say, God, I will step out in faith and look for my possibility in you. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I want to see your hand right where you are, if that's you. Wow. Hands going up all over this place. Literally, hands all over this. You can put those down. I'm believing my God's going to do a miracle. I'm believing my God's going to give you a new perspective, and faith is going to begin to take you through a process, and the blessings are coming. I didn't do this in either of the other two services, but somebody in here, you, you, we, we laugh at Abram's callousness toward God's blessing, but some of you have said this very thing, I can't be blessed because of what I did. See, that's when God tells you he loves you. That's what you say, but you don't know my past. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear right now is that Jesus died for that past. And he's still promising you hope. If you're one of those people, or if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I didn't embarrass anybody else that raised their hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. Pastor Don, it's impossible. He would not accept me. It is possible because he's calling you now. That's what you feel in your heart. That's what you sense. Some of you are facing mountains. I, I'm trying to pray, but I, you're facing mountains mountains of pain somebody there's a major opportunity ahead of you and it seems impossible and you're daring to believe right now god's going to make it possible but if you're here today and you say pastor don i want to give my life to jesus what i thought was impossible that i'd ever be forgiven i'm willing to receive christ i want to pray for you as well right now if that's you could you just hold your hand up right where it is I, i'm not going to call you out thank you thank you thank you who will join with these three? Are there others? Today's your day. This is your moment. This is your time. Thank you. You can put those down. Listen, I'm going to pray with these. I want you to join hands with someone near you if you're comfortable. Somebody pray a prayer of faith with me. I'll never forget being a little boy and somebody leading me in a simple prayer.
And we're going to pray a prayer of faith with these. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. That scripture, faith cometh by hearing. That's the word of God. Hearing by the word of God. Then by believing that we are changed. We will be born again, scripture says. We're going to pray this prayer with them. Then I'm going to pray for all who've responded. Let's pray together. Jesus, by faith, I believe your promises. And now I declare, I am a sinner. You see my past, my present, and my future. I repent of my sin. I turn it all over to you. I believe you died for me so that I might be forgiven. I believe you have risen again. And now by faith, from this moment forward, all that I have belongs to you. In Jesus' name, God is my Father, heaven is my home, and Jesus is my Savior. Father, I declare favor over these that have prayed this. You see these three that have responded in this service. I declare, God, that you are the saving grace. You are their hope and their joy and their peace. And, Lord, I ask you today by the power of God, Lord, that what they have seen begin in their lives now by faith, Lord, that I thank you you're going to carry it through unto completion because he that has begun a good work in them is faithful to complete it, Father. Thank you that they are saved by the grace of God. And I pray for these others that are facing an impossibility. Lord, I just... just could be the voice of faith saying come on outside come on out out from that problem come on out and look up and trust god for their redemption draweth nigh we will lift our eyes unto the hills of the lord from where our strength comes from thank you father for your favor and your blessing in jesus name amen and amen would you give the lord a praise this morning amen